All right. I'd like to call to order the Pawtucket Regional School Committee meeting, 6.30, January 15th. And we're at the back now. We are not at the high school. Uh, I'd like to roll call. Uh, Wayne Adams, yes. Joanna Blanchard. Yes. Bill Buell. Yep. Emily Dwyer. Yeah, here. Marie <clears throat> Balzani. Jack Hodges. Here. Lisa O'Connor. Here. Chris Redding. Here. And Dina Trotta. Oh, who's got Dina's book? Marie. Marie, you have Dina's book? I took care of Okay. Could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? The flag is behind me. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, uh, before we take a look at the agenda, uh, I want to apologize to the school committee. I dropped the ball on this. Uh, when we set agenda the other day, there were several of these items I wasn't sure of, and then we discussed them thoroughly. And for whatever reason, I forgot all about you people, that there might be some people out here that weren't aware of what even these titles were, which caused several of you to weigh in immediately. And unfortunately, I should have done that in advance. That way we could have got something out for you for those who to take a look at things in advance. I mean, that's what we're here for. So you come in with some kind of an understanding. That was nobody's fault but mine. I'll, uh, even at my age, I'll uh, try not to have that happen again. And I do apologize. Um, Wayne, can I? Yes. So the, the packet that's now online doesn't include the minutes because I it includes that. the hyperlinks. So I'm just saying that. Um, oh. Okay, we can get that. For future, because yeah. today I went to look, I'm like, oh, the one I replaced it with I doesn't do have that. the minutes on it. See? So. <laughs> yeah, done. I'll show you how to do it. See? For those watching, uh, we're in the middle part. of a computer change. <laughs> And there's multiple <laughs> levels where that change hasn't taken place, so we're not getting uh, total information to everybody every time. Okay. And again, I'll apologize for that. Apologizing. Don't do it again. Thank you very much, Mr. Hodges and Mr. Buell. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion on the floor to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. 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 All those, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? And the pass. Well, let's take a look at the business meeting for December 18, 2018. Do I have a motion on the floor to accept this? So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Opposed? And one more, the business and finance meeting, December 18th, 2018. Do I have a motion on the floor? So moved. Second. And a second. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Passes. All right, we have quite a few uh, people in the public today. And this is time we'll take some time, limiting at five minutes, uh, for public comment. Is there anyone out there that would like to say something? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. DeMore. Well, uh, my name is Joe DeMore from uh, Nine Cherry Tree Lane, Groveland. I want to... First of all, congratulate the school committee for hosting this very important meeting with the superintendent. I heard his presentation back in December at a school building uh, committee meeting regarding the contingency plans for the schools and the sound educational delivery that will be made in the event that there's a failure of a building, particularly the high school, so that's really important information. Uh, delivering that information here at the school committee is important. I am thrilled, that people should know this, that on uh, January 24th, there will be a joint committee uh, meeting with the Board of Selectmen members, and again, the superintendent will present uh, this very important information. 
I was on the school building uh, committee uh, and the school committee back in 2007. So people that attend school committee meetings and building committee meetings um, tend to be in favor of the school building. So I am really thrilled to see that the Board of Selectmen platform will be used because that will gain a larger audience and you'll be speaking to people that tend not to attend a meeting such as this. I have been asked by Bill O'Neill, so I want to make this public, uh, that on February 4th I will be presenting as a taxpayer, just my perspective in favor of the buildings, new building, uh, February 4th, the Board of Selectmen meeting. That'll be a full agenda item. I think uh, they're going to give me about 20 minutes or so. I certainly invite all of you and certainly the superintendent to join and perhaps even lead. Uh, uh, and I can support you at that meeting. Certainly, you know, we can certainly talk about that. But again, that was an invitation unsolicited by um, Bill O'Neill. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Jamal. Is there anyone else? Yes, out back. Well, Jen, I think you stimulated this a few meetings ago to get a second public comment, and we are going to have one at 7:45. We're going to have it on every agenda because it makes sense that whatever we talk about might stimulate <coughs> some conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to re reiterate Mr. Demore's comment is on January 24th, that Thursday. Uh, it's not mandatory for us at all, but by all means, uh, go to that meeting to support. Again, that meeting is 6 o'clock at the Merrimack Town Hall. On the, it's on the upper floor, and it's all three towns, Grove and West Newbury and Merrimack, their boards of selectmen, uh, and their finance directors will be present. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I guess uh, there are no more questions. I guess we can move on to superintendent's news and the contingency plan update. Great. Thank you. So uh, just a couple things. First, I want to thank Bagnell for helping us out in this quick last minute uh, situation. Um, Greg Haddon, our facilities director, just wrote me back about four minutes ago. They're still not through down to the pipe yet. <clears throat> They're trying to get there, so water continues. They've shut the water off, which is good, but obviously that's we have no water in either the middle school or the high school. This is the main um, this is the, this is the main water supply to the schools. So is is the problem out at the street level, or is it coming into the campus? I don't think they're sure. They're not sure. I can only give you a blank face. My my. So We've had water pipe, problems before that have impacted the building, like directly in water yep, gushing. Absolutely. We're not there. It's like out where it's not. So it's bubbling up right at the corner of on Main Street. Yeah, Main Street and uh, the high school road there. Okay. Middle school road. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. I've got wonderful video footage of it. <laughs> which I think is, I saw it today yeah. when I. Left you might campus. have seen the picture anyway. Lots of very bright lights on 113. There are a lot of bright lights if you go in front of the middle school and high school. That's absolutely true. So we've got, uh, next up is the contingency plan update. I, I've given you, I know the, when we talked about the high school contingency, we went over those different options. We went over what was vulnerable from most vulnerable to least vulnerable, the likelihood, the independent assessors saying that there was an imminent failure on both uh, our HVAC system and the uh, electric system. <clears throat> so what I've done here is just put on a single sheet for you uh, just all the contingency plans. And this is, we've done this, we've had several meetings with the principals from all the buildings, taking into account what they can hold in their buildings. Um, and I also included in there, you'll see that second column is the building value. Now that's off the tax assessed value of that building, off that set from the assessors of each of the towns. Uh, and that 30% value, of course, is that important number because anything 30% or higher we have to do a complete redo of the building to make sure everything is up to code. Um, so there's all the values and the 30% value right there. The next column, you can see the short-term plan. So I'll go over each of these um, so you understand what short-term is. Short-term and long-term, in the regional agreement, the school committee 
actually has the ability to declare an emergency, an educational emergency. And in any event of an emergency, you have the authority to tell me, okay, we want to implement whichever plan we want. Um, the towns, each individual town actually does not have that authority. Uh, and that's going to be part of the conversation on the 24th as well. One, I believe, my take, because we are tenants of these of the regional buildings and of these buildings, that we should have that ability for the academic needs of the students to be able to declare that emergency. But also, the towns should also have that right to say, hey, we, we don't like the way this is going. We need to revisit this regional agreement. So there's some language in there um, that will be discussed on that 24th. But <clears throat> the... Um, for the middle school, on a short-term plan, the middle school would go down to each of its respective schools, and the schools would become pre-K through eighth grades. Uh, and we believe we can handle that. And of course, that middle school option is not if it's a middle school failure, but also if there was a high school failure, the high school would end up at the middle school. And we've talked about some of those challenges already. There's one period they have 48 classes. There's another period they have 47 classes. Even when we go ahead and make three classrooms in what the old, was the old band room and two classes in the cafeteria aside from lunch, they cap out at about 44. Uh, so in those instances, the high school is going to ha will have to get somewhat creative. Um, another point I want to make is that the detailed plans, what we're trying to get to is we know everything's very situational, but if the high school were to fail, so the build HVAC system fails and we know we're going to be out of there, we want to know where this teacher is, what classroom is this teacher going to? Uh, so I've worked closely with Greg Haddon. There's some, like, just, we're going to be purchasing just big containers because from the Page experience, when Page failed, we realized, or they, they had this experience where by giving teachers bins, letting them get what they need into those bins and label them, they would take those bins and put them into the classroom so the teachers could get into that classroom and unpack and have their new space. Um, so that's what we're still preparing for all of yes. But also in the example of the page or some other hazardous situation or semi, you know, where you don't want a bunch of teachers in the building, that makes such sense because they could say, oh, put X, Y, and Z in this, you know, location and you get the moving done without having to get all the teachers right. per so, se on site. Right. So Which so may or may not be possible. The idea is miss as little school as possible. It's going to be an it's going to be an uncomfortable adjustment for a lot of for the adults, for the kids, moving from one building to that new building. Um, <clears throat> but as the reality situation, I think Paige, there was an issue with the air at the time, so only certain people could go in. So again, everything's so situational. But we will have on hand each year an updated because of teacher changes and things like that, who goes into what specific classroom. And that's what we're trying to nail down. But so what you're getting is just kind of the broad scope of what's going where. But an actual contingency plan with all the details, uh, we will have. So the long-term plan, you'll see in all of these. I don't care which way you go down. The optimal educational option, and this is strictly from an educational standpoint, is to regionalize by grade if we run into a, a, a problematic situation. Um, the alternative, and I put down an alternative to consider. Uh, the alternative for the middle school, we know that we, we have space at Donahue. We can put the 7th grade at Donahue, and the 8th grade can go to Page. That helps from the standpoint of you can share specialists between 7th grade and 8th grade. So you might have a foreign language being done for 7th graders on Monday, and that might go to um, Donahue on Tuesday. So you can, you can share those, and that's clearly optimal. Um, the short-term plan, I'll just reiterate again, the 7th and 8th grade go to... Uh, the schools here, that no longer becomes an option. In both the long-term and short-term plan, access to those high school curriculum and high school teachers is not an option. Um, that will not be possible. So your students who are taking sports medicine, uh, who are doing electric engineering, those, that, that is no longer an option um, on either one of those plans. Any questions first in the middle school? Okay. So Bagnell, this is the second largest school in our district. Um, so you have an awful lot of students. The, the pre-K and first grade would shift over to Sweetser. Second grade through fifth grade would go to Page. There's also a language, Bagnell House, a language program, they'd go to Page. And sixth grade would move over to the middle school. We know we have space in the middle school for that. Uh, 
the alternative there is actually that short-term plan is a good long-term plan as well. I mean, in both of those instances, the pre-K and first grade going to Sweetser, they also are pre-K uh, and first, um, sorry, that should actually say pre-K through first grade. They also have those same exact classes. Um, so that would be easy for them to just absorb and there's that opportunity for collaboration. Second through fifth, again, Paige, they have those already. Uh, the sixth grade to the middle school, that's going to be for the space situation. You don't have space. Um, so the sixth grade of middle school uh, will be a standalone within that building. I'll need to make a note to go change that. Okay. Questions on Bagnell? Donahue. So for Donahue, uh, the third grade would drop down to Sweetser. I think there was a point in time not too long ago that we, there was possible consideration that Sweetser would actually get absorbed into Donahue, uh, but we've seen Merrimack's population continues to grow, so that is not a feasible option uh, at this time. And then fourth through sixth grade would move over to Page. And again, that alternative there, that short-term solution is a good long-term solution as an alternative as well. For the high school, we've gone over that extensively. Uh, the middle school, high school go to the middle school, and the middle school moves to its short-term plan. Um, Page, so Page, fifth and sixth grade would move to the middle school. Third and fourth grade goes to Donahue. K2 goes to Sweetser, and the pre-K would go here to Bag now. What did I spell wrong? Nothing. We knew the answer to that one. That was last year's plan. Yeah. So for those so you of you in the audience, <laughs> if you were at, at Page, you knew this was what the plan was last year. And, and I will tell you, I, I know the parents may have had a little bit of a struggle with that and kids moving. but. For my talking with the teachers of the, all the elementary schools, uh, talking to some of the students and the teachers of Page, they actually enjoyed working with their peers. Uh, and again, from, that's why I will always say, from an educational standpoint, there's no question that bringing the teachers and the kids together is beneficial. Uh, but you do lose, from a parental standpoint, now losing my 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 town's elementary school. Um, <clears throat> and then Sweetser. If Sweetser um, pre-K through second grade would go to Page, and the district programs that are there would shift over to Donahue. Uh, there's a lot of district programming over at Sweetser, um, so the space that, pay, that Donahue has would get taken up there. The it, it, sorry, if you looked at Page for the alternatives, we had a discussion, we'd have to look into it about where students are and do you, where do you put them based, do you put them somewhere else based on geographic location. Uh, also, for the alternative, pre-K through second grade go to Bagnell third, uh, and the third grade from Donahue would go to Sweetser and four or six to move to Donahue. So those are, there's a lot of moving pieces. And in Sweetser, the long term, <clears throat> the school would move to Page. Um, and you need, we, need, we would have to figure out what to do with a special education program, which we've not solved that one yet. If you were to ask, and I, I know you're not asking which of these is the most likely, I would defer to Greg Haddon. Uh, he's not here because he's in a big hole on 113 right now. Uh, <clears throat> literally. Yes, quite literally. Uh, but, but obviously I think we all know that the high school is the most vulnerable <clears throat> in this. Um, the middle, middle school is going to be up there, but so too, uh, I asked them the other day, we lose our funds. Um, we, each school gets out, each town school gets allocated funds. So Bagnell and Page are almost gone already. Um, and the Merrimack schools are actually they're in very good shape. Merrimack schools, what they are needing in the near future are uh, boilers. Um, and we think if the vote does go through, we might be able to find a way to help Merrimack out with those boilers because we know we have three new boilers running the middle school right now. Um, and that was an MSBA project along with the uh, roof of the middle school, or 25% of the roof of the middle school. So this is uh, just a road map uh, that I wanted to put down <clears throat> in front of you so you could see all the possible options. And th there's a lot, and there's probably 25 other combinations. This is really a combination of the principals sitting down, thinking and working together about who could go where. I know like in this building, for example, um, Ms. Buteri's been trying to figure out how do we move 
uh, a seventh and eighth grade over here if we could we house that and, and that's there's a lot of displacing that goes on but uh, what I want more than anything is to make sure that the learning opportunities for our children does not get disrupted um, for an extended period of time and we know there will be disruption but if we can minimize that and get people moving quickly that makes things much easier Yes, does anybody have any questions? No questions? Well, we can uh, move on then. Which brings us to new business, and we're going to hand this off in a second. But keep in mind, in front of you, we passed out the preliminary budget. Uh, both Dr. Bartholomew and Mr. Labrack will answer a broad spectrum questions tonight, just general, and, and when I turn it on to them, they will generalize what it is only. If you hold specifics, we're going to give you two weeks to uh, analyze it all you want because we're going to meet again as of now on Tuesday the 29th for a budget meeting, primarily. There might be something else that crops up between now and then, but on Tuesday the 29th at the high school, 6.30 I believe, uh, Put it in your records, and by all means, uh, uh, any questions dealing with the budget, please be as specific as you want to be at that point in time. So until then, who would like to start us off? I have a question. Um, are these new books, or just sections have been replaced? Greg? This is a new book for this year. You know, it, 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 it mirrors what I've done in the past. In she has last year's book. I have people's notes in it. This isn't a new book. Well, that's no good. No. Does it say fiscal year 2020? Yeah, no, on the outside it says 2019. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Oh. Is that Wayne Adams in it? Thank you. That's strange. Well, no, it's probably because I returned one recycling oh. today. Oh, did you take the papers uh, out? Not out of that one, but out of the other ones I did. Does anybody have two fiscal year 2020 books other than Marie? Because I just did you want to use my oh, that's like, uh, yeah, okay. I'm I'm sure. Actually, I think yours is still right, probably much yours. Yeah, probably thesis. Oh, fine. <laughs> okay. But the outside still says 2019. Yeah, the outside says 2019, but the inside is correct. So, who would like to start us off? Would you, uh, so, Dr. Bob? Right yeah, I'd be happy to. So. <clears throat> I think you've seen it in the papers. We started off with a gap of about $1.3 million. We know that uh, traditionally we have increases. So you'll, you'll have a gap initially because you'll have the natural raises that take place, and then you have to expect, you have to account for GIC. So we usually run about three fifths, somewhere around $350,000 as a gap from one fiscal year to the next. Uh, we have, however, experienced a large increase in special education uh, funding, and as I said at a, at a prior meeting, uh, I, when we talk about special education funding, uh, the children deserve the proper education. Um, for me and for a lot of my peers, uh, this is one of the biggest issues in working with our legislators about how do we how do we do this? How, how are we going to continue to sustain? Uh, I know Dr. Jarvis had um, has been polling his peers, and our budget, 30% of our budget or just over $11 million goes to special education. Um, <clears throat> and that's a huge chunk of change. Uh, and I, I don't know the exact number, but we're trying to figure it out. But I would bet you if we rewind 10 years, and go back 10 years ago, that's fifth, not even close to 15%. Uh, so things have changed quite a bit. And as long as the formulas stay in place the way they are for funding, uh, we, we, our budget for special education and trans, transportation by itself is almost $900,000. Um, so we're, we're coming up with some creative ways of looking with possibly partnering with nearby neighbors to do some of our own collaborations and transportations and programming. Because uh, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a parental standpoint, that would keep my child closer to my home district as opposed to my child going far away. Uh, but those are things, you know, they're outside the box ideas, things that don't, aren't traditionally done. But we're looking at ways to try to fix that. But the problem is that we won't know if that's feasible until fiscal year uh, 21. 
Um, so we're going to try some of those things this upcoming year. And if we get some help from the state, that would be huge and that would be tremendous. I think we all know, if you're sitting at this table, that this budget is our responsibility. We're taking care of this. We'll send this to the towns. But we still need to wait to hear what our health insurance increase will be and what the governor's budget ends up being. Uh, and those two things will help us finalize what actions we have to take as a school district. Fundamentally, the biggest pieces in this budget are going to be, one, <clears throat> making sure that the students have access to the same programs they've had access to in all previous years. So if I've been playing the trumpet, playing the violin, if I've been um, taking electrical engineering, if those are courses that have been, uh, the students have interest in, we want to make sure those are maintained. So that's in there. We also, I think I've always, you've heard me say this several times, but one of the, the first goal was to make sure that the early grades had support. We know that reading and literacy help predict and helps with student success down the road. So in our K, K through two area, the goal is to get some additional support in there for those teachers. Because of our small school towns, you'll have 48 kids show up in a, in a grade level. And if that's a kindergarten, that's two classes of 24. Now that's a lot. Uh, we strive in our, I think in our goals, we say we don't want to increase over 20. Other districts say not to exceed 25. But we have in our elementary schools some higher class ratios than we do in our high school. Uh, so we're trying to look at that and bring that into a balance, um, but also support those because we know if we take care of those kids at K-1 and 2, it will pay off dividends in the upper grades as well. And the second piece, this should resonate with everyone sitting here because I know I've read about this in the paper, but the second thing, we want to make sure that there was some cohesiveness between our curriculum and all of the grade levels and that there was support. One of the biggest things I heard uh, talking and, and we read in the surveys um, and talking with teachers is there's not enough support. We don't get support. There's a reason for that. Uh, prior to um, Chris Kelly coming on as assistant superintendent, our district was absent an assistant superintendent, and you had only principals in a building. Well, the job is not just the principal is supposed to be the principal instructor in a building. The role of the principal has changed significantly. That is no longer, ideally that's what the principal does, but there are so much administrative requirements of them to do uh, evaluations, to make sure they're at the parent meetings, to deal with student discipline. So in our buildings, we've gone from a, a two administrative model to one single, and as a result, those teachers are not getting the information because the assistant principal position, when something changes from the state curriculum shifts, those teachers are working really hard. What the students are getting for curriculum is excellent. Their students are doing well. I know this because we can go and look at the high school graduation rates and the college attendance rates, but it's not aligned to what the state has shifted towards. And that's something that we've seen pretty consistently across the board. So what we're working at now is establishing, making sure we are aligned, that our curriculum is uh, vertically and horizontally put together in a way that our students can matriculate into the, in, the, in the correct pathway. But if we go back to a model of one superintendent and one principal at each building, that will fail. So the second priority there is to provide that support. And you do that by having, an, a, in this case, an assistant, sprint, assistant principal in, in place so that they can help deal with some of those other meetings. And the principal can once again become a principal uh, teacher within that building. Uh, so those are the two major priorities that are there within um, this budget. And all that, trying to do that while looking at a $1.2 million gap. And I think we've worked that down to... About 300000 About $300,000. We had it down lower than that, and then we got another situation with special ed education uh, situation where the student's going to be out, out of district, so that increased again. Uh, just to echo what he said, um, the next meeting you schedule for the 29th, by that, one of the two remaining unknown numbers will be known by then. By statute, the governor's budget will have to come out on the fourth Thursday. So on the 24th, we should get a first look at what they're proposing for local aid. Um, see how that number works, basically in Chapter 70 in transportation, how much that can affect the deficit. That's strictly a revenue number to us. More revenue that's projected in the budget, the deficit goes down, less it goes up. And the last one is the health insurance number. That won't come out until probably the first week of March. 
So that's a, another big unknown that that'll either help or hurt just before the time the school committee has to make its final vote on what programs or whatever things have to back into this number. Other than that, what the superintendent said is totally accurate, and that's where we are. All right, thank you. All right, as I said, the 29th, we'll attack this in earnest. Uh, new business on B, West Newbury Woody uh, School Committee, see it available. It becomes available March 31st. And if there's anyone here or out in the audience uh, interested, a letter of interest has to go to Mary Ann at the superintendent's office, and it should be in by uh, January 31st. All right? Once again, it comes up on March 31st, yet a letter of interest uh, for that position has to go into Mary Ann by January 31st. All right? Okay, on C, we've got C, E, and F. I guess, uh, Mr. Conway, you're running the show from now on. <laughs> uh, so an update on Infinite Campus. Um, we, as we came and notified the committee uh, several months ago, um, we applied for a, a grant along with the town of West Newbury, uh, a community compact grant through uh, Governor Baker's office, uh, and we received that grant for about $58,000. Uh, and that grant was to permit Kentucky Regional School District to proceed with finding an integrated student information system. Uh, we currently, as a district, use about five to seven different programs. Uh, some of the ones you may be aware of, uh, you might be using School Loop if you're a parent or a teacher. Uh, you, you might be using, if you're a nurse, you're using uh, Health Master. Uh, we have, we're using Blackboard Connect or Connect Ed Messages. IEP. We're, we're using um, e or, uh, a special education program just for the IEPs, uh, Easy IEP, excuse me. Um, and we're, we're using MMS, which is our data management system. The state increasingly over the last 15 years has asked us to uh, report to the Department of Ed on incredible amounts of student data and information that's collected. Uh, we have one data manager for the district, Amy Funk. Uh, she is an absolute wizard. She's been doing great things with all of these different programs. And on top of that, we have all of the, our curriculum and assessment programs that we may use with that information and integrating in. So she's able to, to do all this at a tremendous amount of work. The reality is there are programs and systems out there that are fully integrated, that provide at minimum and well beyond what parents and students and teachers currently get from Pentucket um, and can really exceed that. We had a group of administrators, uh, including some department heads, teachers, who nurse, nurse as well, um, who really sort of drilled down through some possible opportunities and we narrowed it down to two uh, two vendors and their products, um, both Aspen and Infinite Campus. We had both come out and gave lengthy presentations to a group of us, uh, and after sort of making some reference calls as well and, and seeking some things out, um, we made the decision to enter into a contract agreement with Infinite Campus. So Infinite Campus will become uh, the Pentucket Regional School District's uh, student information system. Uh, starting in July, on July 1. But the grant is what actually allows us to pay for the one-time expenditure now. So we can begin our transition now, where Amy Funk's time is much better served. She's a little busy in the month of July and August, so to ask her to do all that then would have been too much. Um, so we're going to enter into that. We, we don't, at this point, have detailed um, sort of timeline and progression. For the most part, parents won't notice much for the next three or four months, and students will begin to have a, a timeline of um, data work and professional development. There'll be a tremendous amount of teacher professional development, administrative professional development, secretaries, and so forth. Um, and then we'll, as we get into next school year, will be certainly as we start the year, students, particularly at the middle school and high school, will need to use the system as well, uh, and we'll have to show parents how to utilize the system in the fall as well so they can get information about how their kids are doing, um, grades, assessment data, um, assignments, 
uh, that they can communicate freely with their teachers, not within a closed school loop, but using the regular uh, prsd.org email domains. Um, so there's a lot to come, and, and uh, it's big news. And it's good for us as a district that we can make this transition. So, uh, If I could just quickly mention as well, uh, when we went about this, um, <clears throat> some of us have experience with power school, but we had surveyed, put a survey out, and we got 80, more than 80 responses from some teachers in, in Infinite Campus uh, and Aspen were two that, that had come up as they, they used mostly as parents. I think we had a couple folks that had used them in prior in previous districts. So we certainly heard from both um, they heard both presentations. But I think what we found was our, our back checking with other school districts about how their experience has been uh, really helped us come to this that infinite campus for us was yeah. uh, the best choice. And the whole consolidation, I think one of the one of the big tasks that Mr. Conway and I have both been at is trying to streamline and make things simple as opposed to searching a bunch of different places. Um, and this brings everything under one single umbrella. Uh, so instead of having to partner with eight different organizations and send checks in eight different places, we have this. And again, this is possible because the town of West Newbury sponsored this and it was endorsed by the towns of Groveland and Merrimack. Uh, in order to get this grant, so it's a tremendous opportunity, and we're very grateful that they, all those towns, stepped up for us. So, good news. Thank you guys for all the hard work. What do you need? Hey, Next one. Us an update on uh, the volunteers and the procedures. Sure. Um, I think it, in sort of a. Anytime maybe a new administrative team comes on board, we sort of look at some different procedures and process, uh, and we've taken some time and taken some feedback from some of the principals and secretaries, and we recognized that we needed to, to sort of tighten some of the processes around um, inviting volunteers into the building. And, and by no means should this be viewed as something that they're not wanted. In fact, it's the other way around. Volunteers are wanted. Um, we just want to make sure that they understand what the expectations are when they come in to, to work in a school building um, and that everyone can be supported in that way. So we have some um, draft language just basically around a, a volunteer agreement uh, that any parent or, or guardian who wanted to volunteer in schools would essentially uh, fill out the, the, the agreement, would sign the agreement, it's a confidentiality agreement, uh, they would at the same time be required to do their quarry check as well. Uh, that information will get collected and then the quarry is done and then their approval is given to the to the school secretaries that uh, people are ready to go. So that will be a change. we will not quite sure exactly. We have a uh, Friday early release date coming up here. Uh, we're doing some training with our secretarial staff across the district on procedures and protocols. Uh, that's one of them we'll be doing uh, and we'll begin to introduce that at some point here this winter. Uh, when everyone's comfortable. So parents, if they begin to fill that out, they see it, that's a new new thing we're just asking them to do, to, to take a read through it and just make sure they understand what's expected of them when they come in and volunteer. So. And we will start having a conversation eventually because we keep on running into a bit of a conundrum as it pertains to field trips and volunteers and field trips and do volunteers need to be fingerprinted or not on field trips because, of course, uh, quarries are good when you're being supervised by uh, a certified person. But we know if you go and do the Freedom Trail, there's an adult that's going off somewhere in the Freedom They usually stay together, but a group might lag behind. And at that point, are they under the supervision of that certified person? And, um, so that's a conversation we'll have to tackle at a later date. But just putting that on your horizon. But at minimum, there are... Volunteers will still continue to do quarry checks at this point. Absolutely. Uh, along now with the, the confidentiality agreement. So. Right. Thank you, Brian. And you can continue with uh, enlightening us on the curriculum. Sure. Um, provided, I think, in your packets was a, uh, some background information. Uh, last year, your curriculum review cycle worked on elementary math curriculum up through uh, seventh grade. Um, that implement, implementation is going on now, going on pretty successfully. Certainly some initial indications from some of our mid-year assessment data is very positive. So we look forward to sort of bringing more information on that. Uh, as I joined uh, the district earlier this year, having conversations with both middle school and high school math teachers, 
um, and getting an opportunity to see what was going on in the classroom, doing some data review. Uh, there were some things we wanted to sort of dig deeper into, in particular core sequence starting in seventh grade on up to about ninth or tenth grade, uh, along with materials. Um, and in conversations with folks at the, the high school level, uh, recognizing some of their Algebra 1 and Geometry and Algebra 2 texts were either non-existent, varied from teacher to teacher, uh, there really was no consistent district curriculum for Algebra 1, mm -hmm. Geometry, and Algebra 2. Um, and, and the teachers uh, were very gracious in their opportunity to have this dialogue and conversation, want to be on the same page, want to use some of the same materials. We simply don't have any. In fact, some of our texts that basically they were using were dated into the 80s. Um, and they are not consistent at all with uh, the current content standards for Massachusetts. Um, and that was noticeable both in Algebra 1 uh, and certainly noticeable in, in Algebra 2 as well. Uh, but then the geometry teachers also recognized what was really being expected of them was not, uh, they needed to come up with their own resources for. So we sort of went down that road a little bit in, in looking at some materials, particularly around Algebra 1 and geometry. Uh, Pearson uh, agreed to enter into a pilot with us to use some of those materials for Algebra 1 and uh, Geometry. And they sent several sets of text and have given us uh, online accounts for all the students. And the online accounts are about to get set up, I think, within the week or two. Um, and the texts came um, either right, right after vacation or right before vacation, actually. Uh, I see Mr. Wilds here. Right before vacation, I think they came. Yeah. Um, so the, the teachers have those as a resource to begin to use. We'll use an evaluation tool the Department of Ed has provided for us to, to see what the teachers feel, uh, how those materials do for them. Um, along with that, we began to have the discussion around Algebra 1 and the difference between Algebra and Algebra 1. And when the standards changed a few years ago and updated in 2017, the state was very clear that there is a big difference between Algebra and Algebra 1. And Algebra 1 is a high school model level class um, that is intended to be really rigorous and challenging. In fact, that one class is often considered the linchpin to future mathematical success. And I provided you some information that our math teachers have been going over and we've been looking at our own data around, around the state's suggestions around when you offer Algebra 1 as a high school model class to <coughs> There was a push going back maybe almost 15 years ago that we wanted all eighth graders to have algebra. And the reality is if we look at our eighth grade standards now, most of our eighth grade students are doing algebra, but not necessarily algebra one. And that's what's different. We in Pentucket have uh, an accelerated seventh grade math class, an accelerated eighth grade, and then those students in that accelerated eighth grade generally move into geometry basically assuming that their eighth grade class was the Algebra One class. We know that's not necessarily true uh, when we look at it. They're really not meeting the full Algebra One standards. So the, the suggestion from the state to, for acceleration as a pathway does start at seventh grade, much like what we have. But that seventh grade often looks like a compacted class. So students who enter into an accelerated class in seventh grade are doing seventh grade standards and the vast majority of eighth grade standards. And those students are well prepared to then go on and take an Algebra I class, but as an eighth grader, which is a, a, an advanced pathway. And then those eighth graders taking Algebra I would essentially take geometry as freshmen, Algebra II as sophomores, and then the paths become a little bit more divergent after that. Um, a lot of our data suggests the amount of students that we have in Pentucket who are taking accelerated seventh grade math um, exceeds what is likely to be a successful amount. We have many students who are entering into that seventh grade math who are not successful in the accelerated math. And then even more concerning, they're not successful in Algebra 1. Uh, and yet we have data that's telling us we know ahead of time they likely won't be successful. Uh, in particular, almost a quarter of the accelerated math students who start seventh grade 
are not meeting the proficiency marks just on MCAS. And that's a grade level standard, not an accelerated standard. So in all that dialogue, we're working up some plans for what that pathway would look like as a point of acceleration in seventh grade. What, what are the criteria, what are the things we should put forward in order to allow students those opportunities to advance? And then beyond that, we know not everyone entering seventh grade is ready, but they may be moving in eighth grade. They might be ready to advance into an accelerated pathway. So giving kids multiple pathways to enter in, into an accelerated mathematics uh, course sequence. Uh, and we know that the high school already provides multiple pathways to students so that we would leverage that that exists for them. So um, I, I don't come to you tonight with the, the absolute answers of what this would look like, uh, but we do intend in February, uh, Ed Hickey, uh, our, our math department chair, uh, along with uh, both Ken Kelly and uh, Mr. Seymour, the middle school and high school principal, will come back here to the school committee and present to you sort of a formal um, a formal proposal to, to change the manner in which that works so that we can ensure that when students move into an accelerated pathway ready for Algebra 1, that they'll be successful. Uh, because not meeting success with that makes all future mathematics classes uh, really, really challenging. Um, and that is not what we want to do to kids. Um, so it's a, it's a little different than when kids are 16 in high school and making choices about, purposeful choices, about wanting to take on an accelerated math class and they know whether they feel like they're ready or not based on that versus when kids are 11 and making that decision for them then. So. Thank you. Emily. So is the Pearson pilot just for the algebra one? Algebra one and geometry. High, okay, yep. so it's algebra one and geometry. Yep. And just the high school kids out for algebra one, not the eighth graders who would, should potentially in the future be doing algebra one. So the one. eighth grade teachers who are teaching accelerated math in mm -hmm. eighth grade have been given a set of the accelerated, uh, have been given a set of the algebra one text and the students will receive the online accounts. Okay. And it's not a pure pilot in that this is what you are doing. It's here are the resources we want you to utilize to be able to teach the Algebra One standards. And we'll assess um, how we like those, those materials. Um, ideally, and I think this is how it will probably come out, in that if you're an eighth grader taking Algebra One, that's taught as an Algebra One honors level class. And the reality is, it wouldn't, shouldn't matter whether you're an eighth grader or a ninth grader. Algebra one honors is algebra one honors. And it doesn't matter who teaches it, whether it's a teacher, an eighth grade math teacher or a high school math teacher, as long as they're teaching to the algebra one honors standards and using the same materials. So whether a student was in a high school uh, algebra one class or an eighth grade algebra one class, it wouldn't matter. It would be the same class. It's not currently what we quite do. Right, that's why I was asking if, because um, I get that that's what it should be in the future. So we're, we're pushing the, the eighth grade <laughs> accelerated to do that type of work, but right. we're also recognizing there's kids who really aren't ready for that. Right, and so. also that it's January and they've yep. had this other path up until now, so they may need to do some yep. creative, you know, problem solving to get along to that. I think as we make a shift, it will probably start back in seventh grade. Sure. It won't, won't yeah. shift every, it'll be sort of, it'll move its right. way up. Yeah. Yes, um, so I had two questions. One is the, so knowing that we have this new change um, in the elementary school, does that segue nicely into Pearson or is that some of what we're trying to figure out? Yeah, I mean, uh, the question is what would students in like a, a, a math eight class be doing, uh, they probably, as we move down the road, the same type of math curriculum that we're using K to six. Um, and that we would use the, the Eureka math for all other math unless until you enter algebra one. The only variance might be an accelerated class in seventh might use a sort of a combination of materials because you're going to combine, you're going to compact two years of curriculum into one right, year. Right. But then in eighth, 
it would students be students who are ready test. would be ready. Yeah. Yeah. So then my question becomes if we have an eighth grader, which I have one of those, who's in the accelerated, how does that look like for the rest of their high school? Currently? Well, I know like they're on the pathway to get to calculus. A, B, or B, C, depending yep. upon. Yeah. Um, but and it's, how, a, it's a pathway to calculus, right. right. But will there be changes for those eighth graders right now going yeah. forward? or No, no I mean, okay. the vast majority of the kids in the accelerated eighth grade math uh, will take geometry as freshmen, algebra okay. two as sophomores, and they're on a pathway to take uh, more advanced math classes in yep. calculus. Mm -hmm. um, whether they choose to take AP level classes or, or whether they choose to move down statistics, but they'll probably take calculus at some point. Right okay. uh, by their senior year, right. sure. Um, and that that would sort of be a pathway continuing for students who take algebra in eighth grade. Uh, but that if you don't get on that pathway starting in seventh, you're not a, you're not eliminated from taking that pathway at other points. Right. And that's what's different from tracking. Uh -huh. And then if you set a track, you get on the track, and that's it. There's no getting on or off. Uh -huh. Whereas pathways, you have multiple points of entry. Uh -huh. um, so another follow-up question would be when you're initialing, initially taking the kids from sixth grade and moving them up, um, when we started offering the middle school, we, Pentucket, offering the middle school accelerated math was when my senior mm -hmm. was going into seventh grade and there was a test. Um, is that what we're, th and then the test, people were upset, no, my kid should be in it. Like, how do we draw that line so that students who are in it are the ones who should be in it and not just the yep. parents or, and I think that's what we're working out, and we're okay. looking through some of our data. If you, lead the, if you read the guidance from the state, they're pretty simple and direct about it. Right. Have an entrance test okay. that measures readiness, yep. and that's it. Yep. I, I say yes and no. I think we're working on both with seventh grade it's teachers and eighth grade teachers. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yes and no. no. But, yeah. uh, there, is, there is value in that, in right. knowing that. But we also, I think we do recognize that at times, Kids can show readiness in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you still have to have uh, an apples to apples comparison when we're taking students from uh, three different schools and right. from even multiple math teachers, even just mm -hmm. within those schools. Um, Which should be more aligned now that we have a district wide. We're getting math there, yes. Yep. Knock on no, wood. We're getting no. there, yeah. Right, right. Yep. Yep. Um, and then my final question, and I'm sorry that I'm monopolizing, but. Um, in looking at this kind of middle school through high school, um, one of the things that I think we don't necessarily have in place from experience is those challenging parts of the curriculum that go beyond, yes, and you do geometry and then you do pre-calc and you, like, like that pathway, but there's somehow looking at how some of the kids who that comes naturally to, how do we then have additional challenges for them? Do you, know Do you mean, I mean prior to the seventh grade point mm -hmm. or well, I think, students? I think all throughout. I okay. think I think we teach kids to get to a certain level, but I think there's kids who are already at that level and they go through this curriculum and at no point in at no point are they challenged from the outside. A teacher might say, here's some extra work you can work on, but that really doesn't have any value for the students. Yeah, but, extra work is not yeah, sort of yeah. challenging work, it's just so, more work. So that's yes. the one piece that I think We've given a lot of pathways, but I don't think we've given, for instance, in English, there were some 10th graders asked to do AP English this year. Like, that's a great way to challenge kids who need that challenge earlier on. I don't know that there's those same types of things, because you're not going to take AP Calculus until you've taken all, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's a sequence that needs to happen. But somehow thinking about how we can get some of those other yeah. challenges for some of those kids. And I think it's a, it's a sort of a broader discussion mm -hmm. with our curriculum and yeah, our sure. instructional practices, for instance, right. and making sure that we develop instructional practices that are sort of based on a tiered system. Yep. Uh, and, and that really provides more opportunities. And when you think about learning from a universally designed perspective, we often use that phrase in terms of those who need additional supports, but right. the reality is there are many students right. who can use those opportunities to demonstrate everything they know um, and really get into something with, with a passion right. and be able to demonstrate it to a teacher in a way that was different mm -hmm. than how that teacher necessarily designed or, or expected it. Right. Um, so I, I think that's, those are steps that need to be addressed as we move along. Mm -hmm. 
um, those are not things that tend to happen overnight. Right. Uh, but Lisa, you had a question? Um, yeah, so um, this is concerning special ed students. Um, so we have language-based math um, for students that, um, that require that. And before, you know, I think believe that program is at the back now. Um, before with our elementary students, or we were doing everyday math, and the language-based math students were doing other programs to kind of support, you know, the everyday math. So if we are moving away from that, and even as we go into the middle school and high school for the, for the students in this population, um, what's that going to look like? And how is it going to work with this? Because, you know, if a student might be in language based in elementary, they might not require that level of support and go into inclusion in middle school. Mm -hmm. So are they going to be able to... Will they be lost? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, when you talk about specially designed instruction in a special education program, like what you're describing, that uh, specially designed instruction is meant to meet the needs of those students at that time. Uh, Eureka Math follows the state standards, so regardless of whether you're familiar with the exact Eureka Math presentation, the reality is that the standards are what even the students in language-based uh, programs are receiving instruction on, making sure they're meeting the standards. Um, but it's just provided in a different setting. Uh, so we do want, you know, the, the goal for anybody who's in sort of a sub-separate or, or, or a separate programming is that we find avenues for them to integrate into general ed settings if it's supported with the right supports, like inclusion. Uh, and I don't think there's anything about Eureka that prevents that. In fact, Eureka really has a lot of layers around universally designed for learning. So it provides students an opportunity to come and learn a concept, um, and it doesn't require the exact phrasing, the, the exact procedures. In fact, it moves a lot away from procedures, and it gives kids multiple opportunities to solve a problem. So I, I, I think we're, we're in a place where we'll continue to be able to support students to be able to move into less restrictive environments. And thank you. And my second question is, is this all going to be done in books and paper? Are we moving into, you know, tablets? Like yeah. before we used to do Khan Academy and kids would have homework and, and be able to sign in and, and teachers could kind of see where the kids are at. So what's that so, going to look like? So the Pearson, uh, it, no one pilots materials anymore. Um, no one provides you materials anymore that are just a textbook. They won't do it. Uh, the reality is they may give you a set or two of textbooks. Uh, they almost give those away for free. They want you to have the annual, they want you to have the licenses. So it's a multi-year commitment in licenses to have e-book uh, access. Uh, so that's generally, particularly at that upper level when you get into the content uh, of Algebra 1 and Geometry and Algebra 2, they're really e-book licenses. You'll have some hard copies that will go along with it, but the reality is it's, it's e-book work. Are there any questions on this side of the table? Good. One of the challenges we had with some of the students that Lisa just described that could not get to the levels of algebra that you were hoping they would, we set up a pre-algebra. We kept the word algebra. We thought that was important uh, for the student. We also thought that was an important label for the parents as well. It was well received. And then we met each kid individually based on their need. We met them at whatever level and then grew it. Response? Oh, I had a question. No, I'm just making a comment. Oh, okay. okay. So, I, I mean, I think the important part to remember here is uh, when students take the NCAS test in 10th grade, uh, that 10th grade math test measures Algebra 1 content and geometry content. That's what it measures. So, if we take a student off that pathway, uh, we're making it awfully difficult on them to expect them to meet the the standards on that MCAS test. So we have to be really thoughtful if we're going to take a student off that sort of minimum threshold pathway. Uh, really encouraging students to take Algebra 1 as a ninth grader at minimum and then Geometry. Uh, and, and they can take it at a college prep level uh, in, in preparation and they'll, they'll be prepared at that point hopefully to meet the demands of the MCAS test. There are some students who don't and there are some students particularly those with, with particular learning needs who may take a different pathway, 
um, and, and those are team decisions uh, that are more appropriate to rather than sort of larger curricular decisions. But that's where we want to keep that sort of minimum threshold pathway for curriculum at that level. Are there any more questions? Yes, we can move on. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Thank you. This brings us to the regional agreement, and I would say, Dr. Bartholomew, you yeah. have to catch us up on this. I will catch you up. So the regional agreement is nothing that the school committee uh, design, develops or votes on. It's a finance advisory board that's responsible for, you have a member from each town meets, and then ultimately each town in their town meetings needs to vote and approve any changes. Um, I've met with the finance, finance advisory board, uh, and just some things I want to draw your attention to, the language that the boards of selectmen that will give them. Um, so you don't have this in your packet, but just, so section four, it talks about the location of schools, and these are the proposed changes. Um, <clears throat> but section B reads already, there, there should be no less, not less than one elementary school in each member town, students in grades pre-K through five or six, shall attend schools in their own towns of residence, except in cases of emergency, as defined by the Regional District School Committee. So that's what I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, children attending special education, low incidence classes, regional magnet classes, or inter-district inter school choice. And this is the additional language to this. In such instances, refer to the Pentucket Regional School District Contingency Plan as approved by the T Pentucket Regional School Committee. So when we finalize that contingency plan, this is just asking mm -hmm. that if there is an emergency, the school committee says there's an emergency, that it's my job to make sure we have an updated contingency plan so everyone knows if something happens to this building, uh, we know where the children are going within the next, we know immediately where the children are going, then we can start pre preparations in 24, 48 hours, have education still up and going. Um, so that's the one change. And under that same section, which is, talks about the location of schools, there's an entirely new added part, um, F, which doesn't exist, but the proposed language on this to the towns, uh, when necessary to implement due to an emergency as described in Section 4B, the Pawtucket Regional School District Contingency Plan will be in place for not more than one year or until all towns have had the opportunity to convene a special town meeting for the purpose of reviewing the regional agreement. So... <clears throat> When there's an emergency that we, you have all declared there's an emergency, suddenly we have, we no longer find necessarily the K-5, K-6 grade configurations. We can shift to whatever's in that contingency plan, but each town has that ability to call, as long, unless they call a special town meeting, they talk about it with their constituents uh, and their residents, they can come back and say, look, for the regional agreement, these are some changes we need to make. Uh, Overall, the idea is to make sure that there's a continued strong relationship between the school committee and the towns. In the absence of this language, the thought is the school committee could just go do whatever it wants to do and ignore um, the desires of the people. And I don't think that sets us up in a collaborative effort, but it sets up some possibly against one another. Now, would it be a special town meeting in each impacted school, or all three have all to three, have? Uh, all, because it, it would necessitate okay. a change to the regional agreement, so it would okay. be all three. There, there, there is language here and that is in the existing one that talks about an impacted school. Um, two of the three towns have to say, yeah, we're sticking with that if that's what. So if, if for example, something happened here in Groveland, and uh, Groveland didn't like what was going on, but West Newbury and Merrimack said, oh, no, and they're kind of, we're, we're okay with that. Uh, I hope we don't ever get to that situation. I'd like all three towns to be on board, um, <clears throat> but the two could potentially over, override that home in terms of the education. You can never overtake the building. Right. Um, so the other, only other change is to the, um, the budget part of this where we're taking out some language that just talks about what the Finance Advisory Committee, who will be in the Finance Committee and it changes to uh, that they're gonna meet from time to time with Regional School Committee Chair, the Superintendent or Business Manager to discuss matters that may impact the district and or towns. Um, and at the very end, oh, we've added signatures because I like things signed and dated. So we know when someone signed an agreement and what the date of that agreement was. Uh, we've seen several times now uh, in our district and also within some town documents 
that there's been something that's been voted on, but we don't know when it was voted on and where, when it was last reviewed. The regional agreement, for example, the top of this is 2014, July 1st, 2014. Uh, that was the one that was last amended, but I don't know if someone's reviewed it since then. Um, and in, in terms of amendments, Section C, this agreement will be reviewed every three years, and this is a change by a group comprised of the chief financial officer of each town, the PRSD business manager, and the PRSD superintendent, who will make recommendations for changes to the member towns boards of uh, to the member towns boards of selectmen. So the biggest piece of there is just that addition to the contingency plan. And I think because of where we are with things, that's a very important piece. Again, a page last year and Donahue seven seven years ago or eight years ago are two glaring examples. We don't need to be in a situation where something happens and we're trying to figure it out for several days. If something happens, we need to be able to mobilize and, and respond. Um, does anybody have any concerns? A oh, concern, a question. Um, so the leases were done around the same time we last reviewed that. Are those? The leases were done in 2014. Did they, they have, finally got done? Do they have a date that those need to be reviewed to? 20 years. 20 years. Leases. Is there any language in the leases that might have to change because of the contingency? Excellent point. You know what? Very likely because of the descriptors. Very likely right. good, yeah. Well, because they're kind of married together. Yeah, they are. They're, they're very, so maybe that's, that's how that's we got it passed. That they did link together, yeah. Maybe okay. that's something that needs to be. Yeah, we'll look at it. Thank you. Well, I would not have known. Because I was here for the original. <laughs> there you go. That's why I said. Leases of what? Leases the of the three. So there's a lease agreements between each of the three towns and one the district. Sure. <laughs> now, I'll just say so when, when this goes to towns, this has to be done at the same town meeting for all towns. And this, in this instance, it, well, I think, believe this actually would go April 29th to the towns. They'd have to put a warrant out for it. So that's why we're reviewing it next Thursday at that meeting. Uh, but April 29th, we'll have both the potential um, amendment to the regional agreement and also the proposed building would be in that same town hall meeting. So. If anybody watches this video, or if you're in the audience, <laughs> very important that you show up to those town hall meetings. Use your democratic power and vote. Are there any questions, Dr. Bartholomew? No? Okay. Well, we've taken care of new business. This brings us to Miss Elise and the rest of the public. Are there any questions or comments you'd like to make at this time, now that we've covered an awful lot of material? Yes. I have a question. Um, how does the public see the, the budget and any proposed changes that are in there? It'll be, it'll be uh, put on the website hopefully by tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to apologize. Is it identified by changes? Usually. Like, like, you know, like, it'll show, is it, is it, is it every uh, line shows a five year history. That'll only be for dollar parts of it. There will, there is a staffing chart in there. We can that can also be put up online as well. We usually, usually do the elementary chart. I'll do a full blown one for the district this time. Um, it doesn't necessarily show by school as much. It does show by school, but because of the changes at the elementary level, it's not readily identifiable. Because at this point, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out. So, but yeah, we can, that'll do up. The narrative will go up. The budget will go up. The elementary proposed elementary class sizes will go up. In that district-wide class uh, staffing chart. Sure. Sure. Uh, it'll show. It'll show us the number of music teachers. I don't, don't believe that's the case at this point. I believe it's I more of a rotation and everything as no. we've gone through the, shall we say, not the school choice and the lessening of student population at the elementary level. At certain areas, it's possible now for a teacher to entertain teaching yeah. in more than one location, but not program.
Yeah. Yeah. Right now, what I can do for you is this. We don't. We don't. We don't know. None of, so programmatically, nothing's been finalized. So even teacher-wise, things haven't been finalized. Um, so we're not sure. We know. I know from uh, for us, like in terms of supplies, materials, central office, in order to provide support down to the schools, we we've took a, a sixty percent cut there. Uh, but we we're right now just in the process of looking at what we have for funds, what we have for staffing, and then working through with the principals what is going to make the most sense for them and their school buildings, but with the goals of maintaining that students have access, the same access they've had this year that they would have again next year. That's that's always, that will be the goal. We can, uh, okay. um, I sure. apologize, when public comment, if uh, you identify yourself oh. and to tell us where you're from. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Um, I have a couple questions. We told you last year. Um, my first question Name? is could you clarify just, just a little should bit be at the microphone. Um, this thirty percent idea and before coming to the meeting I was reading something that somebody had written about um, the systems and the cost to replace each system as we get ten million dollars per system. Um, Yeah, so, uh, yes, so, <clears throat> thank you. I wasn't sure I thought we were talking about budget. This is good, though. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just go ahead. So, so the answer to your question, yes. So the 30% value, the way that works is, so anything that's going to be 30% or more, everything needs to bring be brought up to code. So that's eight, to make sure everything's ADA compliant. So as the example, if you look at the high school, the high school's value is $12.1 million. So anything that we have that's $3.6 million or more, we cannot fix. We cannot do that. It would have to be a full all-out repair of the building. So for us as a school district, as the towns, at that point, <clears throat> we'd be faced with the question, so no students would be able to go into that building at that point. Um, and the HVAC, again, is the most obvious uh, situation. Of course, you'd never know what's going to happen, but that's the most vulnerable spot. It's been said time and time again uh, within these documents. But if the HVAC goes, then we are in a situation where we go with the contingency plans and the towns have to decide, are we going to spend, we know the estimate <clears throat> is 73.2 or $72.3 million to repair the high school. And that's getting the high school that you got before, but just brought up to code. Um, so someone might ask, why is it so extremely expensive? Well, the hallways have to be a certain width. And the hallways are not very wide, so it's, you have to... So you're moving load-bearing walls, and I'm not an architect or an engineer, but that looks like it's going to be a lot of damage that has to be done. So in that process, you're going to have to do abatement and all those other pieces. Uh, but the way I like to explain this to people, <clears throat> when I was teaching there uh, in my science classroom, that science classroom I was teaching in was the same science classroom that was there when it opened in 1956. Uh, and it would be pretty much, as long as it was to code, the same classroom uh, in 2021, whenever they got fixed with those repairs. But the towns would be responsible for that entire amount because this would not be an MSBA project. And if the towns say no? That building's closed. And then the contingency plan becomes permanent? Okay, so in essence, this, uh, the school vote situation could come up very suddenly if the HVAC fails in high school. Is when you say the school vote, what do you mean by? Whether to build the high school or not. So that, so that, that decision could come up very quickly if the HVAC system. Yeah, can't. So so if the HVAC on April 29th is when that first vote goes, and the right. following week is when the people go to the ballot, and <clears throat> that is the only time when that vote can take place. So if after that, if if the vote goes in and it's a no and then the building fails, the towns are have to decide what are we going to do. Okay. If a vote goes in and it passes, the towns are still going to have to decide what are we going to do. Because um, I think there's a, in that case, if, if the HVAC failed in the middle of May, right after the vote, 
and the vote passed, we're still now going to be faced with three years of a long-term contingency plan. Okay. Um, I just have two more questions. Sure. Sorry. Um, so in these contingency plans, um, and in what I read prior to the meeting, you talked about um, new staff needing to be hired. So um, has anybody um, sort of put their feelers out to recognize what the availability of staff is? I'm in education myself, and I know there's a huge shortage. So I'm concerned for how that's going to play out for our kids. Are they going to be in classrooms with uncertified teachers or? It's a great question. So, so actually, great. it's a conversation I had with Mr. Kelly because we're trying to not go out and have to hire a whole bunch of new yeah. teachers in the middle of a year, whenever it is. Uh, what it does, what does end up happening, uh, you, you're gonna. We have teachers right now that have dual certification. They might have math and they might have history, so they may end up having to teach, even though they're teaching math right now. They might end up teaching math in history, uh, and we, we, based on the licensure we have right now. We think we can cover our core classes. What we can't cover are going to be those alternative classes that a lot of our students take uh, over at the high school. Um, they just they won't have access to those. So, in, in your question, so how easy is it going to be to find another person to teach athletic training or electrical engineering on a full time or part time basis? That 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 would be extremely difficult. <laughs> so, I will check with Greg Haddon right now and see what the update is. And yes, so that's contingency. Yes. Uh, so I will tell you right now, there is no contingency plan if that water main and we lose both of those buildings. Um, yeah, alternative that, learning day. Alternative say. learning year is one of my. <laughs> uh, so there's. Will they be doing alternative learning in this last week of the semester? Boy, you, you sure hope not. Yes, we have another question. Thank you. Um, Aaron Rich, um, um, I just wanted to encourage you, especially in light of the water main race issue, that you send an email communication out to all parents in the district um, regarding water main rates, um, as well as this summary of the 30% piece. Because I think yeah. there's a huge amount of people who have no idea um, what that looks like. When we are looking at a really gradual building, um, the middle school, the high school, the middle school actually has some issues as well right now and we got people are aware of. So I'm just concerned that if we um the, the, the people are very aware that it's just 30 percent seat. No. Yeah, so one of the things we're going to do is when we start talking about the building project and answering that question of why. Why are we doing a building project? Uh, and certainly the age of the buildings is a primary factor. They're, they're long beyond their expectancy, and we see the failures um, have crept up over the last, over the last 15, 20 years. There's been issue, issue, issue. Um, but I, I think also, so what we're wanting to do is get with the building, explain all of this information. And we're working with a group to just put together some quick snippets to be able to, so if someone wants to go to our website, visit the website and click on those links, that they'll be able to see an explanation of what's going on, uh, why we're doing this, and, and the 30% piece is a complicated question. You'll have a lot of people say, why don't you just fix it? Okay, that's answered. And there's a whole um, dictionary's worth of documents on the building plan, I think uh, when Dr. Mulkleen was here, he helped put together a statement of interest, and he and Jonathan worked on that, and so did the building committee. But within that, uh, one of the pieces uh, that's written in there is this evaluation, and the evaluation goes on numerous places to say that these systems have long outlived <coughs> their life expectancy. And in a prior meeting, and I will say this again, because it was said at the building committee meeting, um, but within that document, they talk about some of the electrical situations that we have, and, and we do not have pieces. So they do not manufacture 1956 HVAC pieces anymore that we can easily go and access. It's not like a 1956 Chevy that you can go to, a, you might be able to find one somewhere out and about in a, um, a car dump, pick out that part and go, that, 
you, it doesn't exist. So all these pieces that are rusting out, they, they're going to fail. It's just a question of when are they going to fail. And time and time again in there, they talk about um, our facilities, you can't find the pieces. So we're having to find and make our own pieces. And I don't know that we've gone the 3D printer route yet, but we may. We may have to start going that route. Uh, but we also, uh, th all those talk about, they, it talks about how uh, in the electrical piece specifically, that in the classrooms, just so we have the proper power, so the teachers and, and uh, students have access to what they need, that there's boxes placed in places that are not, they're not the uh, most ideal, they're not necessarily the most secure, um, but that it was done by the facilities folks so that we could keep things up and running. Um, so when people say, you know, it's, it's been neglect, it's not been neglect. In fact, I would argue, having been there as a student and as a teacher, that our facilities people that we've had work there have always been committed to that building, and they're doing everything they can uh, to make sure that's done, what, what, that school keeps up and running. Uh, I've got a picture I'm looking at me right, looking at right now of a big hole. <laughs> the break is six feet deep under. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Slow going, he says. They're in the hole, though. But still on the so, so, but this is the kind the of school, dedication right? I'm talking about. I'm looking at it right now as someone in the hole on 113 trying to make sure we got school tomorrow. Um, and that's, that's just what, so that's what our facilities folks do, and that's what the towns do. They, they rally together, and they try to take, make, make sure things are taken care of. Chris, comment? No, not on this. Okay. All right. And we have a question out back. Yes. Um, when the schools are in high school. Um, even as a parent, and I look at, is this ever going to get off the ground? Um, I think you absolutely hit it. The more that parents and non-parents, so all these grandparents who don't have kids in school anymore and who don't care, when you start telling them that we're going to use accreditation and all these kids in your neighborhood are going to shift everywhere because of your lack of saying yes, I think we have to do more with our own neighbors to say that. Yep. So, so let me just, this is a perfect opportunity for me to plug this. When we get back from February vacation, every Monday through Thursday, I will be somewhere in one of the towns and communities just talking to who, people. Now, I don't know where that's going to be, but if, you, if you're going to have people over your house or you have a community event that you think I might be a good guest at to just talk about the building project, my... What I want more than anything is to people to go to that ballot with eyes wide open, that they understand I get what a yes vote means for implications and what a no vote means in implications. Um, I, I'm not going to go around and canvas telling people to vote one way or the other. That's not my job. My job is to make sure that people are voting with facts. Um, and, and some people will understand those facts. I, I mean, yes, I went to school here and then Pawtucket, but I've not been in Pawtucket for 16 years. So I'm coming out from out of state into this district. I'm coming out of a new building, an older building, and then into these buildings. And yeah, I mean, I could talk all day long about the differences of what our students have access to in North Carolina and the new buildings that they don't have access to here. Um, and we could talk about the, the likelihood of a failure. I mean, and that's not even me. That's just outside eyes looking at it saying, this is probably not a great situation. Um, and I, I would also say that we've had 18 years to consider this. And now at this point, are we looking at it saying, okay, well, we got another 18 years of the building. Are we going to try to get another 18? Or are we looking at this building now and saying, yeah, we're, if we can get another 18 weeks, that'd be good. Um, I, again, it, just talking to the facilities director and just walking around the building and looking, it is by far our, that is our Achilles heel in the district in terms of structures. And, and also, but to my point, so if you are going to have, after February, vac, vac, after February break, Monday through Thursday, if you have a group of people who just want to hear about it, uh, and you can host 15 to 20 people, I'm happy to just go there, informally talk about it. I, I, I think informal is really good because you can just, you'll be more apt to just ask questions as opposed to this formal setting, which is a little more intimidating. Um, but just get as many people together, and if, they, if they're for the building, not for the building, I don't care. 
Um, I'd like to hear all the perspectives, all the sides. I know there's a lot of questions now I can answer. There's very few that I can't, but the ones I can't are going to deal with the, infra the architecture of the building, the infrastructure of the building. I don't know the mechanics of the building, uh, but I can talk most about all, all the other aspects of that, that new project. But I'm very, very, very happy to do that. And Ms. Naffa is more than happy to schedule me. And she's yelled at me already that I've already booked all the way through June. But she will make sure that I'm wherever I need to be on those days. And I have to do two a night. I have to do two a night. But more than anything, I need to make sure that when we get to April 29th and then the following May vote, that my conscience is clear, that I've gotten as much information out to everyone so that people know what they're voting for. All right. Yes, out back. Ms. Solis. I don't, I don't think we have it nailed down yet. We know that there's, how many retirees do we have? The, the bigger problem this year, Jen, is most of the retirements were in the special ed area. And that's an area that's actually increasing. <laughs> um, we, usually we have a good mix that retire. Um, I know that there is, for sure, retirements, a elementary teacher at grade level. There is an elementary music, music teacher. teacher. Yeah. Um, and we have an art I'm teacher so at the sorry. high school who is also so mid-year retiring. So Those are the only three, I believe, retirements that we have that aren't special ed related this year. And I'm happy about that because we have veteran teachers who are wanting to keep on working with our students, which is excellent. So, um, so how do you make that decision about whether or not to, like, are they all just not going to be retired? Is that in your plan? Or is there a calculus that you need to decide this position we're going to fill again, even though this person's retired? Again, this is very much draft. So this is like just, we have to get something out there to begin with, only for the simple fact that because we're a regional school district, we're no, we don't have access to cuts at a police department or a fire department or things like that to back that up. It's all internal to us. So right now in the draft that you've got here, you'll see I think we're down about seven and a half positions and how they're going to manifest themselves. We don't know yet. We're still going through it. It'll be part of the discussion with the school committee, whether they're the specialist levels at the STEM coordinator level and things, how they might shift around. So we're not really sure how it's going to play out yet. What we knew, all the thing we really know, and we'll have a good idea after the governor's budget commit, is how much money we have. <laughs> and that's what we have, and that's what we really can't exceed, with how much money yeah, we have. And, and I would say that overall, from, from an educational program standpoint, again, we want our students to have every opportunity that they have this year. We want to make sure that maintains. Uh, if we're able to do that, and, and classes, in some instances, I know there's classes that are extraordinarily small, 8, 9, 10, 11. If those classes are going to have to collapse down, but our students still have access, our students still have the access. Um, just, if I could just push back for a second on that. I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate you making, rather than cutting things, um, but if a, if a student, if you offer, you know, four sections of something and you cut it down to two, the students really aren't going to have the same access to the program. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I don't know how you get around that. Mm. Yeah, all right, right. So, 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 so to that point, if, if a student, if uh, I'll use kindergarten as an example. If you went eight to one on that 24 class, that's going to be three teachers. So on an eight to one ratio, are you getting a better uh, educate? Are you getting better information than you are on a 24 to one at kindergarten? I, I would say probably. And I think we could. Um, I mean, who doesn't like being in a smaller class, more individualized attention? Right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a fair statement. I mean, even right now, we're still sitting here at three hundred thousand dollars short. So again, yeah, but so, or, or not, or maybe the governor gives us a half a million dollars more in our budget in Chapter Seventy, and suddenly stuff comes back. Yeah, and I would hope that if it was, you know, at that seven and a half, and we talk about recommendations that we make, uh, but the goal would still be to somehow retain those people within the district. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Elise. Anyone else? 
Well, I got one piece of information for some of you. Uh, Principal Jonathan Seymour has communicated to the central office that we should have a student with us for February. So if you're wondering why we don't have a student rep at this time, uh, they haven't quite figured it out yet, but they're pretty sure they'll have somebody with us for February. Now, Emily, you have something for us? Motion to adjourn. We have a motion on the floor to second. adjourn. Right. And a second. Discussion? All those for in favor? Opposed? <laughs> adjourn. So, so people that are, all the guests, if you want to talk, if any questions, I'll go over there and you can ask me about the building project, contingencies, and I will answer away to the best of my ability, if you have any questions.